And then also the opposite is, applies. There are conditions that are known to cause systemic hypertension. And again, underlying uh, systemic and non-cardiac diseases that are well known to cause systemic hypertension are fundamental to, to consider in the, in the diagnosis, in the, in the confirmation, in clinical decision making. You have a high reading, yes, but do you also have evidence of disorders that would cause this patient to be systemically hypertensive? And this is you know, all you can find. However, the most common are definitely chronic kidney disease and uh, hyperaginocorticism, diabetes in dogs, and chronic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, and hyperthyroidism, probably hyperthyroidism even more common cause of hypertension and diabetes mellitus, but I don't know. Then there are more, uh, more exotic conditions that we do not see on an everyday basis. So it is important, since we know that we are estimating a value, to put it into the clinical perspective. There is evidence of something that might be supporting my finding, and or there's evidence that my finding is likely to be causing some damages to the organs we just saw. Now, the clinical recognition also comes to which cutoff values are, do we use? And, uh, and again, on the, on the guidelines, it's not, that, it's not that straightforward. Guidelines don't give you a cutoff value, yes, hypertensive, no, no non-hypertensive. The guidelines give you, uh, try to propose a system to say, for this, um, for this given figure of systemic systolic pressure, this is the risk. However, this, this cause and effect relationship hasn't been, hasn't been validated yet. Uh, I can tell you what I, what I do, and I base that on unpublished data from the University of Illinois. These are numbers from 52 healthy cats, followed up for a bit to prove that they were actually healthy. And um, so my, my approach is that get the systolic arterial pressure of greater than 170, and I prove the presence of target organ lesions. That is enough to call that patient hypertensive. Uh, without evidence of target organ lesions in cats, usually you end up ac accepting a reading up to 180 and 190. And then without target organ lesions, you have to confirm that in three occasions, three or more. Well, I don't know if I get to the more, but at least three separate uh, readings. How about cats? It, we, excuse me, how about dogs? In dogs, it's better because we have way more data and we have breed-specific data. Are these breed-specific data so important? Only in certain breeds. Um, if you go through these values, pretty much greyhounds, salukis, are the outliers. Uh, so in sighthounds, yes, they do have a higher blood pressure. Um, there's not a really big difference across the, the other breeds. And my take is that usually with target organ def damage, uh, greater than 160 is highly suspicious of hypertension uh, without ev any evidence of target organ damage, 170, 180 on three or more ideal occasions. And this is, this is my cutoff. And it really doesn't matter if you're using the Doppler or the Cardell. We're still talking about systemic, systolic hypertension. You're really worried about mean in anesthesia. You're really worried about systolic hypertension when you talk about the uh, you know, internal medicine case beyond the anesthetic phase because as far as we know in our veterinary patients the problem is systolic systemic hypertension not diastolic systemic hypertension like in human beings okay we have completely different conditions and cardiac disease so that's it for this part and uh, then let me spend a few minutes on uh, talking about ECG mainly acquisition and you know what your your, your main um, um, contribution in this case would be acquiring a diagnostic ECG and troubleshooting the easy and avoidable artifacts uh, because that caused that's it, just a waste of time to interpret artifacts and uh, sometimes it's fairly easy to, to, to avoid them. So modern uh, ECG machines are multi-lead ECGs. Some of them are programmable, some of them allow for digital storage and some of them have preview monitors. Do you need all of these features? Well, it depends on how many ECGs you run in a day. But while having a monitor and digital storage and having a programmable disease sounds like a luxury in most of the cases, having a multi-lead ECG does make a difference, and we'll see why. The settings of an ECG are pretty straightforward. An ECG 
when you print it, it's, it's, it's a, a, a two-dimensional graph on a Cartesian plane. So you have an x-axis and a y-axis. The, the two most important things you want to set up are the units of measure of these two axes. And a uni unit of measurement of the x-axis is the paper speed, uh, either 50 or 25. 50 small, small animals, 25 large animals, so horses, cows, and the like. Or in small animals, when you're not interested in making any measurement, but you just want to document killing the least amount of tree possible, you want to document the rhythm for, for, for a bit. Otherwise, I would suggest you in dogs, if you want to make measurements, to run it at 50 millimeters per second. And then the sensitivity is the units of measurement of the y-axis. It's pretty much how big the complexes are. You can make them smaller or bigger. The nominal sensitivity is, is 10 millimeters per millivolt. And then you can half it, go down to 5, or double it and go, down, go up to 20. It really depends on what, you, what you're looking at. Uh, if you have a good quality ECG, you can make the complexes bigger, for instance, to uncover uh, tiny little deflections that may not be visible at the normal sensitivity. However, if you have a noisy ECG and you double the sensitivity, you also double the noise, so to your eyes, there's no difference. It's still hard to interpret. And then you want to have the filter on most of the time. You can try, but I can tell you that only probably 5% of the cases you can get by without the filter on. Recording leads. So when we talk about a multi-lead ECG, we talk about how many leads are we recording. And leads uh, have nothing to do with the clips. Okay, let's separate leads and clips. Leads are lead 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, and AVF, which are different perspective, of different ways to look at the heart from the electrical standpoint that are generated by the machine. Then the clips that you actually place on the dog are usually the, you know, the four limb clips. And uh, thereby with the four limb clips, you generate six leads. And I say that because sometimes there is a bit of confusion between what is a lead? Is it the actual cable or something else? Well, the lead is what the, the machine generates on the printout. So with the four limb electrodes, uh, which are placed in this order, you generate the six lead ECG. Lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and AVF. Then if you want to go, go ahead and also record the chest leads or precordial leads, you get up to a seven, eight, um, nine or 10 lead ECGs, but it's not done in clinical practice, in everyday practice. Um, again, you need a protocol also for your ECG, so you usually have to somewhat document the patient information in the form of a sticker on the printout or in the system itself. Select your parameters. Uh, all ECGs, if you want to make measurements on your ECG, the patient must be in right lateral recumbency. All the normal values are derived from patients in this recumbency. If you run an EKG on a standing dog, it's fine to roll out the VPC. It's fine to qualitatively assess the rhythm and even the heart rate, but all the other parameters do not apply because the heart sits in the chest differently compared to right lateral recumbency. Uh, appropriate restraint, put the clips on, and then uh, run your EKG. So here's what I mean when I say leads versus clips. Uh, the right arm and left arm clips, or uh, electrodes, are those from which the machine generates lead one. Okay, you don't have to memorize it now, don't, don't worry. I won't, I won't quiz you. <coughs> right arm, left leg generates lead two and left arm, left leg generates lead three. Is there a way to stick it in your mind without having to memorize it? Just count the number of L's. R-A-L-A, -A, there's one L, it's got to be lead one. R-A-L-L, -L, there are two L's, it's lead two. L-A-L-L, -L, there are three L's and it's lead three. The right leg, it's just the ground, does not generate any lead. It makes all of them possible, but does not generate per se any lead. So forget about the right leg, otherwise everything would be screwed up. My L rules doesn't work if you include the right leg. Okay? And we'll see in a few seconds why it is not a bad idea with the, uh, the, this trick to memorize, to know which lead is generated from which clips or electrodes. So how do we determine, once you have your ECG uh, printout, how do we determine the heart rate? Because that's something you can easily do and uh, that sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's more than enough. So you get your ECGs coming out of the machine. 
there are innumerable ways of measuring, of uh, calculating the heart rate. I'm just telling you what I do on an everyday basis because it's, uh, it's uh, quick. And my mentor used to call it the quick and dirty way. You just drop a big, a pig, a big, a big pen, not a pig pen, a big pen on your ECG. But it has to be a big pen with a cap on. So not really the one that, is, that shows up here. Because those pens are exactly 15 centimeters long. Now, at the paper speed of 50 millimeters per second, 15 centimeters equal to 3 seconds. So if I count the number of QRS complexes and multiply this figure by 20, I get the rate in beats per minute. And it takes really, really a few seconds to do it. And then if you, your ECG is at 25 millimeters per second, 15 centimeters equals 6 seconds, I just multiply the, number, the figure by 10. And again, I get the heart rate in beats per minute. This is very easy. And it's much better than learning and memorizing a way to calculate the instantaneous heart rate by counting the number of little boxes that plotted it somewhere in an Excel spreadsheet by the time the dog is dead, but you get a very good number. <laughs> However, that's an instantaneous heart rate, while what I obtain with the pen system is an average heart rate, which is more meaningful in the clinical setting. I don't care about that single beat. I want to see a, a broader window on, on my patient's uh, heart rate. Okay, So that's fairly easy. So this is a normal six lead ECG, how it should look like in a normal dog. Six leads obtained from four electrodes on, on the four limbs. And the right leg doesn't do anything to generate these deflections. It makes them possible, but doesn't do anything. Okay, So the ECG is composed by a P wave, atrial contraction and a QRS, ventricular contraction, and then a, de a deflection that uh, describes the resetting of the ventricles back to their normal, normal function. Cats, always more difficult. So in cats, ECGs are trickier because they sometimes have very small deflections. And sometimes the noise that they generate with purring, with tremors, with whatever they do, it's bigger a bigger deflection than, than the actual cardiac activity. So this is a very nice and clean ECG in a very cooperative cat. Same sequence P, QRS, and T, same sequence of, of, of deflections, and it's very clean. So both ECGs that I define as clean ECGs have a very clean baseline. That's the first thing you want to say. Okay, did they do a good job? Well, you and the dog, because no, it's, the dog does 50% of the job, or the patient in general. Uh, if the baseline is, is flat, and the ECG is not going up and down in the page, it's, yes, it's probably a good job. And same thing for cats. Now, we, what we want to be able to do is to avoid the most common artifacts. Artifacts are innumerable. I could spend the whole day showing you how artifacts can show up. But artifacts are a deviation from an ECG that goes horizontally and that has a flat line here in the, you know, in, during, the, during the diastolic phases of, of quiescence, electrical quiescence. Nothing, nothing is going on there from the cardiac perspective, so nothing should show up. And let's just see a few examples. 